Welcome everyone to the Deep Dive, the podcast that skips small talk and goes straight for the concepts that shape our thinking and behavior. In this podcast, cold expertise is defenestrated as warm philosophy is enthroned in an attempt to explore the field in which we're all scientists looking for answers, living well. Welcome to another episode of The Deep Dive with Eyal Shai. Today I'm joined by Brooke Bowman. Hi, Brooke. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, and I'm super curious to learn what is an idea or concept that has helped you live well. Uh, well, so one of them I think would be this idea of scaling up that's become, become really important to me. Uh, I'm not sure how much detail you want me to go into that right now but if I like something and I think it's good how can I do more of it or how can I help see more of it in the world yeah that makes sense so uh, immediately obviously it gives me this connotation of, of of the tech world with the scaling that's to do there so um uh yeah do, do you find any sort of uh relationship with that like is that where it came from oh that's interesting Uh, it's interesting, particularly because I've found myself, um, you know, a lot of the things that have happened in my life, the major things that have happened last like year or two have been directly related to Twitter and my, my experiences there, my, you know, the relationships I've formed there. And I am in a really, really tech heavy part of Twitter and I am not a tech person at all. I am like one of the black sheeps in this community because I don't know, I don't know anything about tech stuff. Um, but that, that's a, that's an interesting, uh, connection there. Um, I don't know. I mean, probably that's where it got into my brain because I have a bunch of tech friends and they talk about stuff like that. Um, but it's, it wasn't informed by any, any experience in the tech world on my side. Okay. So yeah, then the next question would be really, uh, when did you first form this kind of, uh, notion or idea? Um, if you want to tell a little bit about your background and like at what point in your life, uh, would it be fair to say, Hmm like a light bulb moment where this comes into play? So I, um, for people who don't know me, I spent a couple of years on the street in Los Angeles and um, I figured a bunch of things out. And that was how I was able to get off the street, out, stop using those kind of drugs and all of that. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that I kind of carried with me from that. And I don't, I, there's not like a particular moment that I remember that I recall being like, oh yes, this is a thing I should do. Um, but I do remember thinking about it pretty early on after I got off the street, which was um, uh, late January, 2020. Um, I had one of the things that I came off the street with was this, uh, like the realization that I could become anybody that I wanted to be. And um, so I really started from scratch. I had a, I got back to my parents' house with a backpack and a cat and no digital footprint. I'd had um, like an abusive ex who had fought for control with me over my, my Gmail, my Google account to try to track my location. So I got locked out of it and uh, which meant all of my passwords were gone because I have terrible, like, like <laughs> terrible keeping track of those kind of things. So I know, no, no access to my Facebook account, no access to my old photos, no access to a whole bunch of things. So I, um, you know, in, in, in most of the ways you can, I, I had a blank slate um, and um, it just felt very fresh in the possibilities of who I could become. And I started out with um, very, very basic things like food, sleep, <laughs> exercise. Um, I wasn't talking to people. Else. Like I wasn't leaving the house. I didn't, I didn't trust myself to turn down drugs. I uh, wasn't really comfortable being around strangers. Um, so I was, uh, I was kind of just isolating at home and then COVID happened. So that just made it easier to keep doing that. Um, and uh, as I, you know, because I was very, very intentional about it, like moment to moment, that was what I was pouring all of my energy into and time and thought into. Um, I, I uh, would just scale those things up. Like, okay, like today I'm not going to take a nap. Tonight I'm going to sleep a little bit better. 
tomorrow I'm going to eat a little bit better. And just like, like every time I could like reach a boundary of where I could improve in one of those like really small specific areas that I was working on, I did. And after a while it got to where like, I didn't need to pay conscious attention to sleep hygiene or to like how I was eating or how often um, those things just kind of like became habit. And then I could move on to new things. And then I started reaching out to old friends. And then I started like, you know, putting some of my thoughts in a discord server. And then I started trying to bring other people into it. And then like, all right, I've got like, I've maxed out like you know the new people I can try to bring into this so I'm gonna start making a blog and uh then it was the Twitter account and then I started meeting Twitter in real life and it was just like like every time you like reach that the top of the hill there's like a new hill you can find um yeah 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 I absolutely love it and it resonates with me so much I mean me at, at one point in my life when I was, as soon as I turned 21 I think basically I just flew over to the States and went on this homestead in Georgia that's off the grid. And I felt a lot like what you're describing of just changing an, env an environment quite abruptly also makes you realize something about the absurdity of the identity that we have and even the habits that we hold, right? So it's, so first of all, I'm, I'm really interested in the, in the move from the street uh, back into, um, a society it's a very small society with uh, living with your parents and being and being in the house but i mean making the move away from there uh was there uh, a certain trigger that was just go uh, telling you to you know enough with that was there al already um a pull or a calling from uh a different brook that could emerge yeah, so I, this could take a lot of explanation to go into, but I will try to make it as concise as possible. There was, there was a moment um, I had been, I'd reached a point on the street where I was willing to doubt and second guess my most deeply held instincts and beliefs. Um, you know, I think it probably, there's a little bit of like that word surrender that kind of like calls to me about that. Um, I was at a place of surrender. And one of the things that I had doubted was, um, and I, like I knew, I knew that I had made some wrong decisions somewhere, but I had no idea anymore what, what they had been. And I met this guy who seemed to be everything that I had thought was bad. <laughs> he was, he was mean and he was rude and angry and bigoted and uh, racist and all these things. And, but he had all the outer trappings of success. You know, he was very clean shaven, handsome, was working long hours, was going to school. And I was like, all right, maybe I have been wrong my whole life. Maybe those things that, you know, people have been telling me are important this whole time are really what's important. And I was like, I'll try it. And so we started dating and that ended up being, um, uh, abusive in a lot of different ways. And um, I had kind of tried to turn myself into the person I thought he needed me to be uh, for, you know, I mean, I had never really experienced anybody being mean to me. You know, this was before it got overtly violent. And um, I kind of thought, well, if I just fix the things he's being mean to me about, he won't be mean to me anymore. And of course, that's not how it works. Mm. Um, but through that process, it eventually that escalated to a point where, where he did I mean, there's no, no hedging about it. Like, he almost killed me. And after that, I realized, I mean, I had stopped using, I had gotten jobs, I had become cheerful. I just poured myself into becoming this person for him. And then I realized like, if I can do that for him, if I can make such extreme changes in my behavior and in my attitude that quickly for someone else, I could do it for me. And that was about six months or so before I got off the street. It took, it took some time for me to really kind of like make changes in my life based off of that. Um, but that was, that was the moment where I suddenly, like for the first time in my life felt okay on like a deep fundamental level. And there were some, there were a few other triggers. I don't know how much detail you want me to get into. Um, I, I had to get over yeah, like, a couple more things. Yeah. Okay. So one of the, one of the biggest things that ended up holding me back was my relationship with my parents. I uh, had a lot of like anger and a lot of pride stopping me from reaching out to them. Uh, I really had to change a lot in my, just my perspective on them for me to be able to come back to their house. And that's kind of what I needed to, to really stabilize and to make the, the kind of like changes in my life that I needed to make. And 
um, it was actually my cat. <laughs> that I had adopted a cat after this point. Um, he, this, this ex was stalking me, but I didn't know that at the point. And I just felt like, okay, I can do anything now. Like I'm okay. So that means I can have a cat. And that was, um, that was a really poor choice. Uh, <laughs> I never thought I'd be the kind of person to adopt a cat when I wasn't capable of taking care of a cat. But, um, so I was staying in this, they call them bandos. Uh, it's street slang for an abandoned house. And this one had some gangsters in it and was a, a rough place, but it met my cat and I were indoors and things did not go well there. And, um, this ex of mine had gotten back into my life and, um, I, I needed to leave there really suddenly. And I was, I don't want to take Pico outside. So we're going to stay in my ex's car with him. And it was astonishing how quickly things got really, really bad. It only took like a month. And I was very explicit, like we're not dating, but it got, it got, it got really, really dark. And Pico was, was really getting, that's my kitty. I uh, was really getting affected. And um, I realized that, uh, like my, my life and Pico's life was in danger when I tried to be honest with this guy about like what I needed and like that I needed to be out of his car. And so I pretended everything was okay for a couple of weeks until he let his guard down enough for me to be alone with the cat. And then I snuck out and I got, um, I got in touch with the ASPCA in Long Beach and they sent an Uber for me. And um, they have a program where they will hold on to pets for you um, in, in, in situations of domestic abuse. And um, so they had Pico for like a week. And I had recently found out, I, like I had finally read through some of his paperwork from the shelter that I'd gotten it from. And I used to joke about how he, because uh, he purred all the time as a kitten. I used to joke that you know, he was just that happy to be out of the shelter. But it was true. When I went and read his paperwork, it's just a litany of notes. Like, kitten will not eat. Kitten returned by foster parents. Kitten depressed. Kitten, like, vomp. It was just, like, it was so sad. He was just, he'd been in a shelter for a month. And I got him when he was a little over that. So he was just a sad little thing that I took out of his shelter. And then because of my poor choices, put back into his shelter. And, you know, I couldn't explain to him that it was temporary. All mm. he knew is that he was back there. And I had a moment of just, just complete breakdown. I was on the phone with a friend and I've never heard him sound that sad. I think he thought I was never coming back from it. I was just like, it's all my fault. I was sobbing. And then I dusted myself off. I was like, all right, I got to talk to my parents. And I called them and they came a couple of days later to pick me up. Wow. So I'm just I'm just struck by the fact how everything there is is kind of the things that are moving the plot along the relationships, right? Like bad relationship, relationship with a cat where it's actually now uh, a naive uh, partner, right? Who needs you to be good to them um, by, by being yourself, not by being everything that they're mad about or whatever. Um, and then the relationship with your parents. So um, it's amazing that it's it's all coming together, and different relationships are kind of taking you different ways. So that's that's super interesting, and I really like how you uh, made that realization that if you can change for somebody else, you can also change for yourself. So was that do you think at, at the base at the base of of your behavior until then. And I'm still looking forward to, to going into scaling up, but I'm just too fascinated with that. Is it, um, was it the case that you uh, didn't see yourself as somebody to change for? Yeah, there, there, sure. There, there, there are a number of things that I kind of realized coming out of this Wall Street thing and sense that just feel so glaringly obvious in retrospect is like why wasn't I doing these things before and I, and I think this is this is one of them like a, a like a smaller more specific example is like I lived in LA for a long time even before I was on the street and I was one of those people who was just like yeah it's hard to make friends in LA in retrospect I was doing none of the things that you should do if you want to make friends I wasn't organizing anything I wasn't going to meetups I wasn't like talking to strangers or trying to like form new relationships and 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 I feel like that's that's you know, kind of like the mirror of this thing where it's like, I, I, you know, intellectually understood that people can change, people can become different, better somehow. But I, I don't think I realized like, oh, I can just like, I can stop thinking about all the things, all the ways that I want to be different and I could just do them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then I'm trying, I'm trying to tie this back with 
with um, with scaling up, and I'm trying. I've been trying to think of the of the thing that y- you you really scaled up when you moved out of the street and started even thinking about these things. So is it a is it um, is it something like and and if I'm wrong with any of these, you can let me know. But is it is it dignity? Is it like self respect? Is it um, like love, what is this, uh, the first thing that you really scaled up by even moving away from the street and, and back into your um, family's house? Um, yeah, with people that, that care for you, right? Agency. At the end of the day. Agency. Mm. Yeah, that's the one that, that immediately comes to mind. Right. So up until then, it's um, you were just like a, a rolling stone, basically just um going wherever they things and people took you yeah i had a conversation with somebody one time when they were like they were talking about how they had realized that they had thought of friendship as a thing that happens to you instead of a thing that you make happen and i think that can be applied in a lot of different ways and um you know ties into the agency thing uh you know that's just the friendship thing is just one example but i kind of realized like i i don't have to just let life happen to me i can i can choose how I want it to go yeah yeah absolutely so yeah I think you you hit the nail right in the head uh with that so and then if if you had now the idea that you can be you can have agency you can shape yourself and you can shape uh the the people around you or the cat around you like give them a good life and your life around you then that's the first thing you you scaled up and then how did you go about uh thinking about what are some of the aspects of life that can be tweaked and, and scaled up? Like you said, you went to the basics in terms of, of just uh, taking care of yourself physically. Um, was it just obvious? Did you just kind of um, consulted yourself through intuition or was it something else? How did you decide on first steps? Yeah, it was it was very much an intuition thing. That was one of the things that that also came out of that experience with the ex was that I realized instead of, you know, I got into this point where I started doubting, you know, even my most deeply held instincts and beliefs. And I realized that hadn't been the problem. It's not that my instincts were wrong. It's that I wasn't trusting them consistently enough. So that's that's one of the big like things that was going through my mind when I got off the street was like what are what are my instincts really saying right now um and I like this is totally a side note but I think it's really fascinating I had a bad sweet tooth my whole life I used to joke when I was using heroin that uh you know I was like Elliot I was on the Elliot Smith diet you know ice cream and heroin and that was not (laughs) far from the truth uh and then when I got off the street I was like all right I'm gonna pay attention to my instincts I'm gonna see you know moment to moment what what my body is telling me uh, I should, I should do. And I kind of thinking of it, I, I started thinking of it like, you know, those, those uh, microwaves, how they have settings, like reheat, you know, and they'll kind of like do a weight thing. And like, I can't do those calculations. I have no idea what power setting things should be on for how long, but the microwave does. And I started thinking of my instincts kind of like that. Like, I don't really know why this is working, but I know that somewhere in my body is, is telling me like, like, okay, you need more protein right now, or you need more carbs. Um, and if I can just like pick up on that signal, I, I, you know, know, maybe there's something to it. So I started doing this thing where when I was hungry, I would imagine eating different kinds of food. And, uh, you know, even if I didn't have them in the house, even if it would take work to, to, to make them. Um, and if something like triggered, like the salivation response or something said, Oh yeah, that sounds good. I like, okay, maybe that's what my body needs right now. Maybe it has some kind of nutrients in it that, that my body's like, yes, we need that right now. And I would do that. Like, I remember one time going out to the garage and getting, uh, getting I wanted soda and I went out there with a little drink fridge and I looked at the choices and we had some apple juice and a big glass jar and then some soda I was like oh the apple juice looks good but it's too much work and I grabbed the soda and then I stopped because like this has been a what kind one of the one of the things that I realized is like I was making choices that were worse for me in the long run because they were like a little bit more energy in the short term and I wanted to stop you know thinking being so short-sighted about my decisions so I went back and got the apple juice and I don't know after a couple months of doing that I would get like you know in a kind of bad mood sometimes think I want chocolate and go buy some and then just never eat it I just don't like sweets anymore really and it's really, really strange because it wasn't, it wasn't something I wanted to try to do. It just, I, I realized like retrospectively that like I, when I was eating candy and things like that, it wasn't because my body wanted it. It was because my like emotional state was, you know, I wanted some kind of like make me feel better right now thing. 
Yeah, no, I, I really like it. There was an, uh, an episode on this podcast with Dave Beck about intuition, and we talked a lot actually about even about um, about um, uh, an intuitive diet. So it's really interesting that you that you share this uh, very like actionable technique of just imagining the food you're about to eat and seeing your response to it. That's great. Are there are there any other um, are there any other ways in which you are kind of uh, checking to see what what is going to be good for you? Yeah, I use I, I've started using things like excitement and fun. I, I just recently had um, a, a thing being discussed with a lot of people in my personal life. You know, it's something that I needed to make a decision on. And I was just like all the options people were presenting to me, which largely like, you know, separated into two different categories. Uh, I just, I was so exhausted. Like none of them sounded really good to me and I was going to do them if I felt like I had no other choice. And then as soon as I came up with a plan that like was in alignment with my values, I just, <laughs> I got so excited again. And, and I, and I think that's like, like this feeling of fun, this feeling of excitement, those are indications that, that something is resonating with me on a deeper level. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. And just to, just to make it clear to myself, when you say fun or excitement, uh, obviously you've, um, you've left behind the whole, uh, kind of super hedonistic lifestyle of just chasing pleasures. Right. So it's, it's, I just want to ask you, can you demarcate between them and say, uh, uh, tell apart pleasure from fun? Like, how is it different? Because in terms of pleasure, it's really, it's really, um, an addict mentality that is chasing pleasures and kind of doing whatever you, you can to chase any pleasure. So if you mean fun in a different way, that's more aligned with long-term goals, or would that be fair to say, like, how, how do you view fun these days? I, I have two different, like kind of conflicting answers that popped up in my head so this is something I definitely need to think about more uh it is possible one of one of them is just that it is possible that I have changed the things I'm addicted to to being things like long-term growth and making the world a better place and novelty and challenge and um it it, so that's that's one possibility because I I don't know how to really because the feelings of pleasure are still there I feel like I am just much better about paying attention to the longer term consequences of my actions. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, it's, it's, it's an interesting way to put it because the word addict comes from, um, addictus in, in Latin, that would be somebody who lost their money or was owing money to somebody else. And now um, he's basically addicted to them, meaning that this other person, he, he becomes somebody's slave. So, um, so dikere is to, is to speak, to say, and add is to um, up to. So whatever this other person says to them, they do, right? That's an addict, literally, in Latin. And it's, it's so true. When you examine it, you can be addicted to drugs because basically, or, or that thought, right? It's not even the drugs. It's, it's the, it's the thought in your head that pops up that you just feel compelled to, to uh, comply with. And when you have other thoughts entering your uh, consciousness, now you're just, uh, picking the ones that are actually beneficial to you that create these more harmonious, um feelings over time so i think that's a that's a really nice way of putting it and we say you know addiction is such a a negative word because we think about it in terms of people ruining their lives Uh, but i also have come to think about because for example recently a friend of mine uh, has started going down the route of like affiliate links and selling sketchy diet pills and shit um <laughs> and you know I, I told him it's like this is not good you know before then he had a business and whenever he needed me to translate something into english or something i was like bring it on no problem like for fun you know um for you anything and now he's, he's given me this task is like could you translate it and i'm like no i can't i i can't begin to go down that route and um 
Then I had this discussion with another friend. Well, you could do it, but you didn't want to. And I'm like, maybe technically, but with everything that I know, with the values that I have and the, and the long-term goal that I want to have, and live, which is living well, because it was in opposition to that, I feel like I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't. Not that I didn't want to, because you know, parts of me wanted me w- wanted to help my friend, and and it's uh, really interesting. So some of the thoughts we do as they say, and some of the thoughts we 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 just can't uh, obey to anymore. Yeah, and I feel like that ties into the scaling up thing um, in a way because uh, when I took out a lot of that inner conflict and I started, you know, from you know blank slate, kind of like, all right, I'm gonna pick out, like, I'm gonna figure out what my values are and I'm gonna follow them. Then it's it becomes so much easier to scale up and to chase those feelings of pleasure because I I I, I can be a lot more confident that they are in alignment with with what's gonna help me thrive. Yeah, absolutely. And what what are some of the things that you came up with that um, now provide the um, the longer term goals or the things that really don't move around? Obviously, in terms of short term goals, you know, we have our agenda, we have our schedule. There are things that need to be taken care of day to day, and these change and shift all the time, right? But what are some of the things that are always in front of you, longer term, that you make sure that the shorter term things also are conducive to those? Connection. Um, I, I have been working on, um, trying to take into consideration, like one of the things that was a moment that happened early 2020, where I realized I I was kind of like one of those scaling up things. Like after kind of, I had built up baseline broke a little bit. I had this thought like, oh, okay. So I've helped myself a bunch now. How much of this stuff is applicable to other people? Like how much of this stuff would help other people? And so that's a thought I keep in my mind all the time or as much as I can, uh, is like, I like this thing. Is it just because I am weird or is it possible that this is something that people, you know, more broadly might like? And, and one of those things, I remember having a few discussions with it uh, on Twitter when I first joined, because I was doing my best to spark what I consider to be like deeper and therefore more interesting conversations. And I had a few people being like, no, like people don't like this in general. I'm like, I, Maybe that's maybe that's true on like a super mainstream sense, but also I don't think so. I think that um, you know I had a phase in my life uh, a long time ago where like I explicitly tried to seek out those kind of conversations with people. I remember spending all night with this like with this super bro like uh, cocaine dealer <laughs> one time, and we just dug into life. And, and I mean, he had neck tattoos. I mean, he. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I've never talked to anybody like this before. And I think like, I think most people, you can get them to open up about things they're passionate about if you try hard enough and if you give them a chance. And um, so, so I kind of lost my train of thought there, but uh, okay, going back to connection, things like that. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I feel like that's kind of like a really big thing. A lot of times that people speak, what they're what they're kind of really saying underneath is that they, they are seeking connection. They're trying to find their tribe. They're trying to find, you know, those moments of like really seeing other people. And, and um, so a, a, I think a lot of what I do is, is just trying to think of like ways I can help facilitate that for myself and for others. It's all very, very selfish at the same time because I enjoy these things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of n- now that you mention it and, and, and drugs in the same sentence, you know, I'm thinking like I've, I've done drugs, not the hardest drugs, but um I've, I've done drugs and of course they give you this this high like MDMA or or something like that gives you this rush uh, which is really nearly only um, matched in terms of excitement with with really making connection with other people you know this is really the the only I think possibly the the thing that you can do sober and would get you the highest is to really have these these um, conversations with people. And I really think, you know, now that you mentioned this, uh, this Coke dealer dude, I'm just thinking, you know, where would he be if, if he had more of these, of these talks? Where would, 
many of the people that are on the street and not just on the street, just are unhappy in their daily lives. You know, where would we be if we had this, uh, if we had just known where to go to get our, our fix, um, talking to people and, be, and being passionate about the, the same things. And uh, I love it that you're now uh, working to, to create that for a lot of people. So I want to ask you um, now that you've, uh, uh, got yourself off the street um, and started to take care, taking care of yourself physically, um, and then thinking about connection, aiming at that, and fun and excitement. Uh, now, what, was that is that linear? Like, was it that you worked on your um, on your body and then moved on to the fun and excitement? Like, was that the very next idea that you started uh, focusing on? It might have been, so I think, I think it was sleep. Um, you know, I quit opiates in 2017 and then did crystal meth for a couple of years and the opiates just completely destroyed any ability I had to sleep well. And even with the people that I was using crystal with, I took me longer to fall asleep. I slept more lightly and I woke up sooner just consistently across the board. I got back to Reading and uh, there were nights I just could not fall asleep at all. Just the whole night tossing and turning. It was, uh, it was very, very difficult. And um, so really focused on that. And then um, it was not long. I, I think I was just getting so much energy from like, cause I mean, it took me weeks. It took me weeks to fix years of like, uh, of, of bad sleep. Um, I, I mean, I had talked to a friend, he's like, yeah, I, I, when I quit opiates, it took me two years to start being able to sleep well. And I'm like, I did this in like two, three weeks, bam. <laughs> like I developed like three different rules. I figured out like, all right, like through experimentation, like every day I would try something a little bit different and try to like, like, uh, you know, uh, um, restrict variables as much as possible. And I narrowed it down to three things that I had to do. And just if anybody's curious, it was like, I couldn't nap. I had to stay physically active during the day and I couldn't drink caffeine after like noon. Um, Cause all of a sudden like, oh, I'm not doing uppers now. Coffee is like actually a thing that affects me. Um, and if I missed any one of those three rules, I would not be able to sleep that night. I and, think that's um, true for anyone. Like, yeah. <laughs> really, when you said these three things, now that I'm saying, so first of all, do you know, uh, do you know the... Uh, the mechanism behind the the inability to sleep because of opiates like what do they what do they do to you long term do you know that you that kills sleep i, I yeah I'm, I'm i don't know enough about the mechanism behind it to be able to speak on that yeah it is just something that i've heard from other people anecdotally yeah but i mean you know i i i i 100 believe you're right about these three things i just think it's probably thing that we should all we should all do like um uh, quit coffee. I don't know what that's good for. I did that a few months ago. Um, yeah. So, so you did that and then started to think about, uh, more about your, um, values and kind of really do philosophy and, um, yeah. What are some stations of the, uh, on the way in terms of what really clicked when you said like, because it's all experimentation, right? As you say now, it's experimentation about the body. It's also experimentation in, in, creating concepts in the mind and trying to uh, and trying to apply them and see where they lead you right so you must have thought you know connection is something that i might want to try and then went ahead and tried it and received awesome feedback right so you uh, but do you remember uh, why it was connection that you went for yeah uh just quick side note i don't know if yeah. this is interesting to you at all but uh with the sleep thing i found that after i had followed those rules just with a super like super like a uh, crazy amount of discipline for a while i didn't need them as much anymore and so it's kind of like this thing where my sleep hygiene like over time gets a little bit worse because like i realize i can nap and like still sleep fine at night but then if i do that too often i kind of actually have to start over um but it kind of gave me a good a good framework for how to like what things i can like look down look at for you know over time if my sleep sleep habit sleep hygiene starts to get worse um but yeah so i guess trying to look at it linearly so the sleep thing was a big one that i was just like super excited about felt um really proud of myself and really like okay i had this idea and it worked things are working and um i was trying to channel that excitement for one thing um i was like calling my dad at work like eight times a day <laughs> like dad i figured this thing out like i was <laughs> he's like Brooke I'm at work stop calling me <laughs> and, <laughs> and 
I, I had also like gotten to, um, you know, I had, when I was on the street, I very explicitly, like completely was estranged from my parents, from old friends. It was kind of like what I needed to do to be able to just like, even like somewhat function the way that I was at the time I needed to like, I was like kind of like a different person. I was in a different city, but I, I called it like, uh, um, the, 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 the terms that I used to describe like being on the street was like, it was not really Los Angeles anymore. It was this whole other city that was like overlaid on it. Um, mm. and then when I got off the street and, um, you know, started feeling like, okay, like some of these changes feel very permanent to me in a way that like, I think I can prove with enough time. Um, I want to start, uh, reaching out to my old friends. Like now I am okay. I can tell them, you know, I overcome the shame about my past. And it was like, okay, I can just tell them what was going on this whole time. So I started reaching out to some old friends and all but one of them kind of was like, okay, Brooke's crazy now. I'm glad she's not doing drugs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was kind of like early on. Um, it wasn't like, I wasn't like, oh, I need to seek connection anywhere. It was, I want to repair the connection between the people mm. that I've hurt in my life. Um, and then one of them suggested I make a Discord server. And I didn't know what Discord was used for. So I started using it for long form writing. <laughs> And, and was just like, I want everyone to be as happy as I am. I want everyone to be able to like figure this shit out about themselves. And so I thought if I just wrote it all down, I would just like magically like everyone would be happy, uh, which of course, like mostly nobody read it. Um, but uh, yeah, so so I was I was writing in the Discord server and then I switched formats a couple of times, like switched to YouTube. I was still in this mode of like, I want to help I mean, you know, save the world, kind of like I like I feel like evangelism, yeah, 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 yeah. But I was like, I have to like I have to actually reach people if I want to do that, and ended up uh, starting to make a blog once I realized that all of my friends in the Discord server weren't actually reading any of it. Um, and I would post the blog post on Facebook, which still wasn't like a wide enough pool, and and I was also seeking a tribe. Like I really wanted to talk about some of my ideas with people. And, um, you know, the people that I'd grown up with who were largely my Facebook friends, just, it wasn't really resonating with them. And I was like, the world's a big place. If I like find a big enough pool and broadcast my thoughts, maybe I will draw people to me who view the world the same way. And, um, I ended up joining Twitter. Goblin Odds was, uh, a, someone I knew vaguely from before and they were in my discourse server. Like you should make a Twitter account. So eventually did just to post the blog post and then kind of realized my tribe was already there and fell off with writing the blog post. And then that's when that like, um, part of this, I don't know quite how relevant this is to the scaling up discussion, but, um, also realized that if I wanted to try to help other people be happier that writing about it wasn't the most impactful way I could do it. That um, a lot of nuance gets lost in, in, in words. And then also a lot of just like, I feel like a lot of how we learn and grow is from the emotional impact of things. And maybe we can't even put words on it right away, but that um, I needed to kind of like teach by doing. And so that's been a part of it. Like just showing people like, yeah, you can just hang out with the people that you think are really cool. You can just do it. And, um, you know, this is what it looks like to be a really happy person living their life in public. Yeah, that that's, that's again, an amazing um, insight, I think. It's not obvious at all. And, you know, actually on Twitter, like I have this love-hate relationship, which we all do with this platform, but, you know, a lot of it, and, and really the internet is this focus on, on words that I sometimes get uh, sick of. Because really what we want to see is not so much um, not so much a lot of text. And then for people who are not, uh, let's say the truth, you know, for people who are not able to really express themselves well in words, then you have Instagram and just kind of this curation. But there's a lot of curation with people. And I, I really like the uh, whenever I do see real art on, on Twitter um, or where, wherever, I think that is something that's that's lacking um and something that we should uh really emphasize when we talk with people that everybody can make art and art is living publicly like you say art is doing that like doing this um playful uncurated uh things that you just put out there that are sincere and true and you know in the end that does show that um, 
you are you are doing what you what you set out to do out there because just talking about changing yourself as a person that's i mean we're used to call it philosophy that's not philosophy in my mind but this has been the way uh philosophy has been described in the past few centuries with people just writing you know being armchair experts on how to live well but actually um, not doing any of that and uh yeah so again i i really commend that like that's that's amazing to me that you that you figured it out um so easily it took me a long time and it's it's only since covid hit um that i really set out to be like well you know all my life i didn't feel much encouragement for my environment to chase my calling or answer to it and really trying to to put myself out there and do something uh, that that can be seen that speaks for itself right and i do think that actions speak louder than words for sure yeah yeah it's a uh, it's it's I, I think that this is lessening now but i i do feel like um particularly before but still sometimes people have this impression of me as kind of a little bit airheaded and yeah i can be i can be pretty airheaded but there is there is a method to my madness and it's certainly not unintentional like the way the way that i interact with the world yeah no definitely it definitely uh, you're not <laughs> airheaded as, as i can tell uh, as far as i can tell but it, it is funny you touch you touch on an interesting point because being kind of bubbly and and uh yeah all over the place seeming to go you know where wherever you want and and doing these things it's it seems odd to us now in the society we live in except maybe we should all aim to be a lot more like that you know everything everything that um so normal, right? Normal is usually where people want to be. I, I want to be normal. If you're, if you live on the street, that's not normal. If you, uh, if you have a, a very radical, different lifestyle, that's not normal. And people kind of um, tend to go back to the mean, right? But normal does not equal healthy right when it comes to mental health particularly so if what, what if if society on a whole has a tendency that's not healthy then being normal is not actually going to be good for you you want you want to explore other things and have um agency like you said and also uh trust in yourself and and your own thoughts so i think that comes with the with the intuition as well, which is something that I've been trying to think about for a long time. But how do you know when a thought that you just thought is something that you should listen to, right? You could always tell yourself is like, well, this is just something and, you know, a couple billion other people wouldn't agree with me. So how can I be right when so many people wrong? Yeah. One of the things that I use for that is, um, I pay a lot of attention to my emotions. If I am angry or feeling defensive about a thing, that means I need to look real carefully. And probably after I'm not feeling those things anymore. Um, I, I do not trust. I mean, there's this come up with, with like the Vibe Camp company a number of times where I'm just like, I can't make a decision on this right now because I can tell I'm actively experiencing emotions and I can't be clear headed about it then. Um, but I um, like a funny, I don't know, uh, there's a, you probably are aware there's a Twitter account, Celatikia. Um, and she, I was at an outdoor meetup one time with her and she was talking about how she was hoping that, you know, tweeting publicly about having a kid would help inspire other people too. And I was like, well, not, it's not going to be me. <laughs> and I just, I watched myself say, I was like, that, that felt defensive. Why was I defensive there? <laughs> I was like, so sure. And it took me months to like come around, like, okay, maybe I kind of do want kids. Cause I have been like, I don't ever want kids. Like that is how I've been my whole life. And like, I apologized to her. She didn't remember it happening, of course, but she'd give me kind of like a weird look at the time. And so like, uh, yeah, things like that. Like if I am, if I am particularly defensive about something, if I'm particularly like angry or irritated, there's usually something else going on. Um, and, um, yeah, I also do a kind of thing where it's, I, I don't know, this is almost making it too formal because it's not quite like this. But it's the best way that I know how to explain it. I will try to, if I think something's a good idea, but I'm like not all the way sure I can trust my instincts on it, I will try to imagine like Brooke in a bad mood, Brooke in a really good mood, Brooke in like all these other moods, like what she would think if this is something she would want to do or she would want to say. 
And if I feel like all those Brooks would agree with it, then, then, and, and again, like this is a, like a little bit too clear. Like it's, it's much more fuzzy kind of like intuitive process that happens. But um, I, I, that helps me, I think, maintain consistency. If it's something where like, oh, no, I don't know that I would want to do this if I was in some other kind of mood or some other kind of situation, then I, then I take some more time to kind of like sit with it. And a lot of times I don't make a decision about something right away. I will just say, um, particularly if I have like thought in circles about a thing, two or three times and haven't come to come to like a clear path forward, I need to do something else for a while. It's not fruitful for me to keep like chewing on this thing. And usually it's kind of like that, you know, shower eureka moment. Um, I will be doing something else mm-hmm. and all of a sudden I'll realize the path forward. And, and it's, it's, it feels like a cheat code. Like it's, it's so much easier to like come up with decisions and, and, and this kind of thing is when I do that. Yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. And, and so effective. Uh, and I agree completely. It's, it's kind of touching on something that I wanted to ask you about any sort of thing that you would, that you, that you want to scale up on. So if it's, if it's good sleep, if it's uh, good nutrition, um, if it's, if it's following the, the fun or excitement, what happens and eventually it's all about having internal harmony, right? And, and being in harmony and creating harmony, harmonizing outside of yourself, other people's lives, the environment you live in, um, et cetera. How do you go about making sure that different things that you want to scale up are not being scaled up at the expense of other things? Like what if some really exciting, fun things, you know, is going to, um, is going to cost you some hours of sleep, for example, like, how do you manage to bridge the, the two? I, I think that might have to do with, so since, since you brought up sleep specifically, um, after I kind of reached that plateau where like the top of the hill for sleep specifically, then I can move on to things that were not sleep. And those, those, those rules that I had to follow every single day, I could start, like, you know, I didn't have to follow them all the time. I could still get good enough sleep. Um, so I don't know, in Austin, I was, I was staying up till four, 7 a.m. sometimes sleeping in until two, but it was, it was fine because it was, that was, um, I was having like real one-on-one, like the like deeper connecting time with people. And that was, that outweighed the, 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 um, possible, like, you know, or the, the actual, um, cost on my sleep. That being said, um, I was not ready to do that when I first got off the street, when it was still, I'm still climbing that sleep hill. Uh, it would have been too much noise. And, and I think that's part of why the excitement thing is, is a key component here or, or whatever kind of feeling people feel, you know, it's, it's excitement for me. That's what I call it, but it's this, whatever kind of feeling people feel when they are like, uh, when something feels right for them. Um, so with, with sleep, I saw that like that, that was important enough that I was not even seeing other people. I was not even taking a risk. Um, even when I did start seeing people for a while there, it was like, all right, no, I'm, I'm leaving right now. I'm going to bed at 10. Um, and then once it became something where it felt like it was incorporated, it felt like I had like crested that hill, then I can move on to other things. And it was never a point, like I was never, I had this overall goal of, I want to be as happy as possible and thrive as much as possible and help other people thrive as much as possible. Um, but it's never like, okay, I'm going to sleep first. And then this thing, it's like, okay, I got sleep. Now what next? Uh, maybe I'll work on how happy I'm in the mornings. And I would start like, uh, it started a practice of like listening to like really upbeat music first thing in the morning. And then I was like, all right, so this is working really well for me. I like feel really good about it. It's like a practice now. Uh, maybe I'll share it with somebody else. And then I started sending friends like upbeat songs in the mornings, which helped with the connection factor. And then also helps them have more fun in the mornings too. Um, I kind of like don't have a, I, I don't know how to like wrap that all together. I don't know, maybe you have something, a comment you want to add. Yeah, I, well, it's the, the thing that comes to mind is, you know, really focus on the, on the foundations and things that you're going to, because we do have to sleep each and every night at the, at the end of each and every day. And this is a kind of a, a recurring thing. And once you establish a, a pattern that is stable, you know, uh, a, a topical deviation from the pattern doesn't mean that the pattern is gone, right? You already know what it looks like. So you can, you can start inserting moments where, you know, this is going off script, but because 
it's actually now contributing to a pattern that's that's up one level on in terms of in terms of friendship for example well you know yes i value my sleep but i know what the pattern is like so nothing would happen if i stayed up late to speak with a friend who really needs it right now and and that way this helps create a pattern of of friendship with people and just getting more practice at you know being a good friend if in and listening and and doing that because we all know it's going to cost us some sleep at, at some points in time so i think i think that's the that's something that i've noticed about myself too is that the the basics are really important and then there's some sort of of layers upon layers upon layers and one of these like very high level patterns is eventually living well which i think um and any of these are are kind of emergent right because it's it's just you you do the stuff and then after a while you see a pattern that it's not that you're really constructing it consciously and putting bricks where they need to go and so on and living well is this pattern that emerges when all the other things are uh, working properly right and you're never in this position where you are thinking that the whole thing might collapse or you have a lot of internal strife with yourself on on what to do and it's all about um letting the different patterns uh, somehow come together and understand that they're not actually disrupting one another even if it's at one point in time you know you're not doing the usual thing um yeah so again i really like it yeah yeah and i and i think that's um uh, uh so it's like things things become i don't know if, if basic is is i mean it is a word that i used um but i almost feel like a similar thing happened with the friendship thing uh because it took me some work to figure out how to just like speak to people in ways that didn't make them automatically think i was insane and and after that then i could start hanging out with people and you know i joined twitter and then i started hanging out with twitter people and once that kind of became a habit and i was like all right i'm gonna do bigger meetups i'm gonna invite more people not just the people i talk to regularly and then i'm gonna do a really big meetup, <laughs> and, you know vibe camp thing that i helped organize with like 400 people um and it's kind of like each yeah each step of the way as these things become easy as they become habitual you can set your aims a little bit higher yeah no that's 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 amazing and yeah to 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 kind of go back to the to the scaling up thing um you you've mentioned uh vibe camp so vibe camp just for those listening it's not just the twitter folks that are listening to this uh vibe camp was uh what exactly broke so it was a um four i think we had 418 people there total um kind of experimental gathering it was two nights outside of austin and um it was mostly for the people and we call it like teapot this part of twitter um people with, with somewhat shared values and um uh there there were a few people who were not on twitter but it was mostly that and uh it wasn't it was kind of a new thing like no one it's really hard to kind of like like label it because it wasn't really a festival, although it had some elements of it. It wasn't really a conference, although it also had some elements of that. Uh, it wasn't really a retreat either. It was kind of something new. And uh, it was it was a, a really interesting proof of concept, I think, because I have been, you know, the, the, the pace of meetups, whether I was involved or not, has been accelerating uh, to my observations. And um, I kind of felt like, all right, I think this would be something people would be interested in. And it was it was really cool the way people came together to help build it with me. And then also how much people really enjoyed it. Um, I, yeah, that was a basic rundown of Vibe Camp. Yeah. So, so up to date, this, this is the latest hill you've crested, right? And then and, and the biggest thing you've you've scaled so um so it started with reaching out to old friends and then making new friends and then meeting with new friends and then organizing this which has been uh yeah that was quite an undertaking i can only imagine um what what are some uh future future goals that you have in terms of things that you want to scale up and um go there and feel that you have achieved i have seen people time and again tweet about how much being a part of this collection of communities, whatever you want to call it. Um, it actually ties back to something I had in mind when you're talking about things being normal, because I think one of the really unique things, uh, maybe not, maybe not super unique. I mean, every, every kind of like 
tribe or group of people community kind of has their own norms, right? But one of the really cool things about this kind of like loosely collected group of communities that I found myself in is that, um, you know, being weird is one of the things that is normal here, which I think is really freeing and, and really neat. Um, but I've seen a lot of people tweet about how how much of a positive impact just being involved in in this part of Twitter has, has had on their lives. And it can't be all of them. I mean, I know... I mean, I, it's hard to even predict, but I, I like have a really strong feeling that what I was seeking when I started using drugs were the kind of interactions that I'm having now on Twitter. And like, I can't even can't even conceive of how different my life would be if I had found this group of people back when I was like, you know, first starting out on that journey. And um, so there are more people out there that would benefit from it if we can scale it up while uh in a way that allows us to not lose lose the vibe and lose what makes it really special. Um, so I want to be a part of that. And um, I think that, you know, one of the things that was really cool about VibeCamp for me and what I wanted to kind of show other people is this is what it's like to live with the people that you admire and that you really enjoy being around. Because I think that's the ultimate goal, right? Like people went to VibeCamp and then there was some, a little bit of like sad feelings when they went back to their regular lives and lost that sense of like camaraderie and connection. And um, I, you know, people, I see people on Twitter talking about Twitter villages, living with your friends, that kind of thing all the time. And it's kind of one of those things where like, I feel like people need to just be like, all right, we are doing this. Let's figure out how. So I would like to be a part of that process. Um, yeah. Yeah. So ne next up, next up is um, uh, living and, and sharing space more, more often and then, um, yeah, just basically being together more, right? Well, I kind of think of it like Visa's domino meme uh, on how to like achieve golden mm. age for humanity. I feel like that's kind of one of the domino steps and there are things that need to be done to achieve that. But if we can start getting like globally distributed nodes of people who are really motivated to make the world a better place and to become better people and to do it together with people that they care about, I mean, that could only have like a net net benefit in the world, I feel like. And it could be the start of something really great. Yeah, I definitely try to um, reach out to people and, and create connections, you know, like we have in the past. And I just see myself, you know, not every call you're going to have with every person is going to be the most amazing call. So it's not even it's not even about making uh, best friends. Right. But allies is just something that I've been I've been going in my mind with uh, the uh, alliance with people. Uh, being open to people, seeing that, you know, we can talk and then we might not even find because I'm weird, you're weird, they're weird. Um, we might not share in the end the, the same interests, but just knowing that we have an alliance, a, a sort of like, a, a, it's almost like a, a social mood, right? Of just like, we're, we're all here. Uh, my well-being will not come at the expense of your well-being and, and so on. And sending out this kind of thinking uh, far and wide across social networks, um, online and then offline, like you say, is something that has been on my mind a lot so that people would start realizing that, you know, their well-being is not mutually exclusive with anybody else's well-being and that we could help one another in simple ways. Um, and even if not, then we sure as hell don't need to ever see this other person as like a competitor of any sort. Yes, more positive sum games, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and that's one of the things that, that gave me kind of like the belief on a, like a fundamental level that something like Vibe Camp was achievable, despite how many people were very much uh, doubting uh, what it could do or what, what was possible there. Um, I it, it became clear to me pretty early on in this part of Twitter that, um, and I apologize, I keep talking about Twitter. <laughs> I know not, not everyone is, like, is, is a part of that, but... Um, it, it just, there's just a wealth of resources. It's got some of the most phenomenal people I've ever met in my life, either some of the most intelligent or some of like the most powerful or richest or have the most like niche expertise in like weird things. And, 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 um, I, I think if we like, you know, even if you don't become best friends with people, there are people who have given me invaluable resources for things like Vibe Camp or in other ways. I've helped people find jobs before just cause like I casually retweeted somebody's post saying they were hiring. And, you know, it changes people's lives in like really, really fundamental ways. And, and, and it's such a small cost to doing things like that. 
And I think if we can all find the really low cost ways to have a powerful, tremendous impact in other people's lives, I mean, it just, it can only make the world better. Yeah, absolutely. So let's uh, scale that up. I should say, um, yeah, this, this, this is amazing. And I could go on for, for very long, but this seems like a, a nice place to kind of, uh, stop and maybe taking the fresh air at the, at the peak of this conversation, um, before we go on to crest another peak, um, uh, next yeah. time, hopefully, um, yeah, Brooke, before we, we say goodbye, I'd love for you to share any, um, uh, contact, follow information of anything you're doing or just where your thoughts could be found and so on. So, uh, well, my blog is, uh, is, is archived at the moment, but I am GPT Brooke, B R O K E on Twitter. And, um, you can follow vibe camp stuff at teapot vibe camp on Twitter. And I think that's probably good for contact info. I appreciate it. Yeah. Brooke, again, thank you so much. I've really, really enjoyed it. And, um, yeah. We'll, we'll talk again for sure. Um, so thank awesome. you for now. Yeah, it's so much fun. This is so great. Like really feel like a sense of like, oh, excitement. Like, yes. <laughs> thank yes. you.